Bjorsen's Beyond Human Power by Lee Milton Hamilton, 1880 to 1972, from Drama Magazine, February 1914. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Plays by Jernstern Bjorsen, The Gauntlet, Beyond Our Power, The New System, translated from the Norwegian by Edwin Dorkman, New York, Charles Schreibner's Sons. In these days when we seem to see a return, even in the life of every day, to a consideration of those moral principles which in other times constituted the elements of vital religion, and when the speculation of such scientists as Sir Oliver Lodge are leading them to the verge of a new and mysterious faith, it is particularly interesting to take up for study a play which a generation ago considered these questions with a larger philosophical grasp and literary vigor. I refer to Jorsen's crowning contribution to dramatic literature, or Ani a title which may be roughly translated as Beyond Human Power or Beyond His Strength. To understand this play, it will be necessary to study it in the light of Bjorsen's own history. The son of a clergyman of the Lutheran state religion of Norway, Bjorsen, 1832-1910, inherited his father's rather liberal faith. This he stoutly maintained into mature manhood, vigorously defending a religious attitude which, as middle life approached, inclined toward the strictly apostolic, national, and cheerful Christianity of the Danish poet and seer Grundtvig. There followed, however, in the seventies, another and final readjustment of his views in this respect. Although he was to hold out longer than any one among his eminent contemporaries in the North, he, no more than they, was to be spared the formidable wrench and the distress of soul that comes from the losing of the faith of one's youth. Despite his struggles, the ever-growing challenge of the experimental and historical sciences finally proved irresistible to a mind in which love of truth was no less firmly embedded than loyalty to traditions. After protracted wrestling with himself, he emerged practically an agnostic. From now on, positivism, instead of Christianity, is his working hypothesis of life, and he constitutes himself its high priest. To be won over to a cause always meant for Bjorsen to transform his new convictions unhesitatingly into action. Sure of his bearings through an intense study of theologic, historic, and scientific works, he threw himself with all the force of his genius and the zeal of the convert into a campaign for the spreading of his views, instituting a unique, though not always well-considered, war on orthodox Christianity, especially on what he considered its excrescences, the belief in a devil and the pains of hell, a personal deity, and the future life. He scandalized his former friends among the conservatives by rendering accessible to his countrymen the essential arguments in Waits' Christian religion in the first two centuries, and after his visit to America in 1882, he even went so far as to translate, with an introduction, the articles of the infidel Ingersoll in the North American Review of 1881 on the Christian religion. Georg Brandes, the banner-bearer of the radical forces in Scandinavian literature, had raised the battle-cry that it was the task of poetry to be useful and to discuss the problems of the times. In other words, that the poet was to be seer and prophet as well, rebuking and forewarning as well as delighting. The pedagogical element in Bjorsen's genius hardly needed the stimulus of Brandes' influence to urge him to seize with eagerness the possibilities opened up by the modern conditions of life. These specialists have scoffed at his knowledge of theology, medicine, sociology, psychology, 
It remains true, however, that at that time few of the delvers into the secrets of nature and the human mind saw the broader bearings of their own discoveries as keenly as did Bjorsen. Thus Bjorsen antedated them in the composition of quote, the modern play. End quote. Beginning with the editor, 1874, three years before the Pillars of Society, dealing with the ethics of journalism, there followed a number of plays that fall like bombs into the camp of the conservatives. A bankruptcy and the new system. Treating of business morality. The king, based on the opposed theories of the republic and monarchy. And Leonardo and a glove, dealing with the question of sex morality. Next in point of time, 1883, there comes the drama here translated, bearing the title or Ane, Beyond Human Power. As the subtitle of the first part indicates, this was to be the first of a series of plays independent of each other, and each to deal with some aspect of what was or Ane in modern society. Only one other play bearing this title came to be written, 1895. This was concerned with the struggle between capital and labor. The force of the Dano-Norwegian idiom, or Ane, is only incompletely rendered by beyond human power. Something is said to be or Ane when it so far exceeds our strength, potential and real, as to be unobtainable, or if attainable at all, only by overreaching, overstraining oneself. Again, to live or Ane is to live beyond one's means, whether of resources or strength, at the risk of ruin. The subject of beyond human power is the problem of faith, that is, for us, of Christianity. Bjorsen's thesis is that, both in its demands upon human power and human faith, Christianity is or Ane that the consistent carrying out of Christian theories would, and does, land us in the impossible and unnatural, and that the essence of Christianity lies in the words, to faith all things are possible. Kierkegaard, the great poet-theologian of Denmark, who for a generation had helped the best spirits of young Scandinavia at the parting of the ways, whether to become sincerely Christian or confirmed disbeliever, says in one place that the miracle in the minds of the Greeks was something abnormal, stunted, incomplete, that we, however, by Christianity, have become, or ought to have become, used to regard the miracle as the something extraordinary, which is higher than the normal, the accustomed, the general. Bjorsen, like the Greeks, regards the miracle as something sickly, uncanny, a monstrosity. Just as deformities and monstrosities are miscarriages of nature in the physical sphere, likewise miracles are a symptom of disordered mental nature. They are, in other words, not normal, but pathological, indicating sick nerves and deranged minds. From another point of view, the miraculous certainly is destructive of the whole fabric of society, setting a man at variance with his father and the daughter against the mother, and so causing it that a man's foes shall be they of his own household. For what is the essence of the miraculous? What does it teach? The drama is a case in point. Its essence is that whensoever a personal will may break through the lawful order of nature, that will is bound to work havoc in all orderly thought and life. All is bowled over by an inexplicable intercession. Men are tempted to think and to attempt to believe irrational things, to ignore normal development and causation. Education becomes spasmodic, social relations chaotic. In this sense, the miracle is explosive, revolutionary. In itself, to ask for things or only, and to expect them, is dangerous. Once we go beyond the lawful order of things, the unexpected, the inexplicable, may happen, as the keen, loving mind of Rachel foresees 
the miracle is no blessing it is a thing terrifying it will kill us finally because it leads beyond the bounds of reality because as sang himself surmises it lifts things off their hinges it heightens man's powers for a brief time as fever frenzy at times gives men supernatural strength only to court a terrible relapse the poet's reference to medical works on nervous diseases at the end of the play which at first blush may seem pedantic thus assumes the aspect of a warning not to rouse the occult and sinister forces that slumber in the depths of human consciousness with a stroke of true genius bjorsen has made the miracle synonymous with the miraculous personality and powers of one man the eyes of all are devoutly fastened upon him in love admiration despair and on him the poet has lavished all the bright and beautiful traits in human character so as to make him even as a god among men he is perfect only and fatally he is not of this world he lacks a whole sense the sense of reality he is like as a child fit to enter into the kingdom of heaven in the remarkable long gallery of priests in scandinavian literature the frauds hypocrites cowards politicians breadwinners fanatics fools pastor sang shines like a bright cherub his motives are altogether beyond suspicion he is of one piece his devotion and belief are implicit not a vestige of doubt enters his soul his absolute certainty of being in harmony with the deity invest his personality with an irresistible hypnotic power over others by force of this quality he performs miracles he heals the sick and raises up the dead i seems to extend his sway over inanimate nature as well yet he does not vaunt his power for he knows it is god-given and far from deriving advantage from it he gives away all he has to the good and the bad alike surely if anybody he deserves to be called a christian and to perfect the illusion this man of all men appears in a land bleak and fantastic and in its way as unusual as the holy land itself if the miracle is not here it does not exist to faith all things are possible this is sang's grand and fatal assumption raising himself beyond his strength he essays to break through the lawful order of things to heal his wife who is beyond his power and destroys both himself and her when it appears that his prayer really has subverted the laws of the universe and that the supposed crowning miracle with his wife is but a deadly nervous crisis which he himself has brought on he collapses utterly there is immense tragic force in his despairing cry of or else it marks the pinhole entrance of doubt with it has fled the faith which was the breath of his life just as a slight shock suffices to shatter the glass of a saint rupertus drop into atoms his heart breaks altogether once it is no longer whole in dry medical language he dies of a violent psychosis here again the reference to the works on la grande histoire is like the lifting of a warning finger besides saying all other characters of the drama sink into insignificance they are but a foil to his glory in all their actions and speeches we see but him reflected and yet what a wealth of magnificently visualized characters and how tenderly delineated there is the profoundly conceived union with his poor devoted wife the born skeptic with her unshakable faith in the supernatural powers of sang who is being crushed between the absolute demands of faith and the practical demands of life then there are the children torn between doubt and faith with half their father's half their mother's nature and with the loyalty of both also the touching figure of the pastor's widow like simeon departing from the temple in peace after seeing her salvation or like anna and finally brat the ardent and impatient skeptic yearning for a faith it is noteworthy that in this whole piece 
aimed as it is at the very vitals of Christianity, there is no professed free thinker. The one who comes nearest to that description, delicate irony, a state church priest of the rationalist wing. Indeed, so great is the poet's fair-mindedness that, especially in the second act, his sympathies, and with him the readers, seem to incline altogether to the side of faith, or at least of those ampler natures who long for faith, the ridicule falling rather on the official quasi-Christians, until they too are caught up into the mighty chorus of hallelujahs. As to the poet's main thesis, to be sure the miracle is not proved. Quite another matter it is whether or no the confutation of Christianity necessarily follows from the miracle, thus being shown to be beyond human power, in the most favorable circumstances thinkable. With Cardinal Newman, the believer may seek refuge in the thought that miracles were indispensable only at the inception of the faith. Again, many Christians would hardly grant that Christianity must stand or fall with the miracle, just as, conversely, the miracle is no argument to one who is deliberately an agnostic. The play ends tragically, but, as in a Greek tragedy, the spectator is not dismissed with horror and dismay, but with the uplifting feeling that air being avoided, man's is a blessed estate. Here, in particular, if no supernatural aid can be prayed down from the blue, yet, and precisely because of that, man may hope to work out his salvation, not beyond, but in accordance with, the laws of nature. Lee M. Hollander End of Beyond Human Power